You know how we talk about pressure from back home, but guess what? There is another kind of pressure that we're not talking about often enough, and this is the pressure that comes from your fellow countrymen in the same country that you now call home. If you live abroad, you have to have two jobs to make ends meet. Your wife will leave you once you relocate. And my own opinion about this is, Hey beautiful people, how are we doing today? I am well myself and I hope you are as well. For those of you who are joining for the first time, my name is Chioma, make yourself comfortable. And of course, welcome to everyone, not just my new friends, all of my old friends are always welcome here. So today, I want to do something different in this video, all right? I am going to be addressing some popular opinions that I have seen flying around on the internet in relation to the immigrant experience, okay? I'm going to be raising those opinions, but then giving my own opinions about the popular opinions. Yes, that's a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. To some people, some of my opinions might be unpopular, but I decided not to title this video Unpopular Opinions or anything along those lines because I feel like at the end of the day, some of the opinions that we think are unpopular are actually not unpopular. It's just that people are not talking about them. Well, maybe that's what makes them unpopular opinions, but make yourself comfortable. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and let's begin. The very first thing that I see a lot online is this opinion that if you live abroad, then you work two jobs to make ends meet, like you have to have two jobs. And my opinion on that is that's not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's not true. Well, at least for me, by the way, yes, I am speaking from the Australian perspective, but I also believe that regardless of the country that you've moved to, as long as you are within the category of people who have moved from a less developed country to a more developed country, I believe that most of what I'm going to be saying in this video will be relatable. Just going by what I know about the minimum wage here in Australia, I do not believe that for most immigrants, so I'm not talking about immigrants who are doing survival jobs, I'm talking about immigrants who are now settled in their career. I don't think you need two jobs to make ends meet. Of course, there are still very practical things that will go into your financial decisions and your financial planning to make sure that your dollar stretches as far as it can. You have to be living within your means. But what I am saying is that it is entirely possible for you to have just one job, be able to make ends meet. Making ends meet in this sense is not just about paying bills. I'm talking about paying all your bills and still being able to save. Okay. So when I see all these very strong opinions flying around online about how, oh, when you live abroad, all you do is work, 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 because you're hopping from one job to to the other. That's the only way to make ends meet. I don't think it is true. People might have personal projects that they are working on, which might require a certain kind of financial commitment. And it might be the reason that they are taking on a second job, a third job, but to tar everyone with the same brush and make it seem as if all we do here is hop from job to job and our lives are all about working, working, working. I don't know where that narrative came from. And I know that it, many of us also have responsibilities back home that we're looking after. All right. But what I am saying is if people were being honest and truthful about why they take on second jobs and third jobs, then you would understand that it's not so much about, you know, maintaining their lives and maintaining their lifestyle in the host country. It might be because of extra things that are going on that they are making a commitment towards. It's as simple as that. So that's number one. Number two. Okay. Remember that this are uh, my opinion. Opinions, okay. I am not saying any of these to deny anybody else's experiences. So I want you to keep that in mind. I'm just talking about me, 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 me. Yes, we're being selfish in this video. Anyways, the second opinion is that life abroad is lonely. And yes, I do see exactly how that might be the case for many people. Okay. Especially when you first relocate, especially in those first few months. For some people, even the first couple of years here, yeah, I can see how that can be the issue. But in my own opinion, why I am even talking about this is because that particular discussion 
tends to overlook a very basic fact that we're all different. We're different people. We all have different personalities. Personally, I am the kind of person who can stay by themselves all day, every day. I'm not talking to anybody. Nobody's talking to me and I am fine. I won't even be calling home. I don't call home that often. Yes, I know that I am casting myself in this video, not because I don't want to call or not because I don't miss my family. It is just how I was raised. I went to boarding school, so I would go long stretches of time without talking to anybody in the family, without seeing any member of my family. And that has just kind of become my life. So I might speak to my family once a week or once a fortnight. Sometimes I might go a whole three weeks before I pick up the phone and call home. It's just my personality. Like I said, I'm not doing it because I want to avoid my family. I'm not doing it because I don't miss them. But for me, missing my family might look entirely different to how another person misses their family. I am not often homesick. I know that I am not the only one who feels this way. I'm not the only person who is built like this right? So when people talk about life being lonely abroad, like I said, I get it. I've made a video about loneliness abroad and maybe you want to check that video because I kind of fleshed out the whole idea of loneliness and why people feel lonely abroad. Yeah, so maybe you want to check that video out. But in this particular one, I'm just giving my opinion to that popular opinion that life is lonely abroad. Having a sense of connection to your new country. If your loneliness is along those lines, okay, it is also different to someone who's loneliness is as a result of missing their family back home. And that is why I said we're all different. I would rather prefer to go out and enjoy new experiences rather than go out and hang out with people. I have a very tight circle of friends. These are the people that I speak to regularly, but even then we can go several days without talking to each other. And I don't feel like, oh, what is wrong? What's going on? Why are they not talking to me? Or why do I not feel like picking up the phone to speak to them. I have found that here, living here in Australia, it is so easy for me to be more exploring of my interests and my passions without the added pressure of having to connect to people in pursuit of those passions and interests. What do I mean by this? I can go out on my own, hang out on my own, and nobody's going to judge me and be like, hmm, what is a woman doing hanging out by herself? In which case, there might then be the pressure to call up your friends and hang out with them or attend activities together. Here, yeah, nobody cares. So I can just decide on my day off that I am going to hang out by myself, you know, just go to a new place I've never been, sit in a restaurant all by myself, have that meal. And I am just happy. I love it. Okay. So life is not lonely for everybody abroad. Number three, mm. this number three, yeah, it is a point that <laughs> some of you will hate me for, but I'm going to say it anyways. This is where I want to talk about unhealthy competition amongst your own countrymen in your host country. I don't know. I didn't clarify from the beginning. The popular opinion here is that immigrants face more pressure from back home. And my opinion is that, yes, that can be the case, but <laughs> sometimes the pressure you face from your own countrymen is greater than the pressure coming from home. You know how we talk about pressure from back home? Oh, family members and friends, as soon as they realize that you've migrated to another country, they kind of have this expectation that your life has suddenly become 100% problem-free, which is hardly ever the case. Some people talk about family members calling them up and demanding for this, for that and the other because they expect that just because you live in a different country, then you must be making so much money. And you always have money to spare. You don't have your personal problems and their own problems should take precedence over yours. Yeah. You know how we talk about that kind of pressure. But guess what? There is another kind of pressure that we're not talking about often enough. And this is the pressure that comes from your fellow countrymen in the same country that you now call home. And of course, the pressure is not similar to, you know, the pressure from back home where people want you to give them money for this or for that. No, it's not that kind of pressure. Rather, it is what I call unhealthy competition. People wanting to keep up with the Joneses, people living beyond their means just to keep up a certain appearance. And it is so funny because this is actually a society where nobody cares. Nobody cares where you shop, what car you drive. Nobody cares what you have. Materially, the society tries to put everybody on the same level. There is a certain uniform 
uniformity that just applies to everyone in relation to how we live our daily lives. Whatever social status you think you have, not for your pockets, as we say in Nigeria, you're the one who is carrying that perception around that you're this or you're that. However, what I have observed, and please let me know in the comment section, if you have observed the same things in your own community in the new country you live in, right? So if you're Nigerian, you're Kenyan, Zimbabwean, whatever, right? Have you noticed this amongst your countrymen in your host country? Let me know. So the unhealthy competition I am talking about is where, for instance, People would pressure you until you go buy a house or pressure you to buy a car. Like I said, the pressure is subtle. It's not like they're coming to your face and telling you to go buy a house. No. You know how people name drop and drop comments in social gatherings. And that's when you start hearing, oh, this person has bought a house worth this amount. This person has bought a house worth this amount. And then they ask you, what suburb do you live in? It's an innocent question, but it's not very innocent. Okay. Or they ask you, ah, oh, is that your car outside? You know, was that your car, there's something else behind that question, right? There's something else behind that question. And that is the unhealthy competition I'm talking about. That's the pressure I'm talking about. Now, if you are not careful as an immigrant, you will find yourself reaching for things that your hand cannot actually reach. Reaching to do things that you're not ready to do just yet or following the wrong advice of people just because you want to be like them, just because you don't want to stick out as a sore thumb or you feel like you're sticking out as a sore thumb if you haven't achieved those things. Let me give you a very real example using myself. We are nine years in Australia now and guess what? We are still renting. Now some people would off of that just assume that there's something wrong with us. Like why are you still renting nine years into living here when there are people who have not even been in the country half as long as yourselves and they're living in their own house? Why are you still renting? That's the thing. I don't need to explain myself to anybody. I don't need to come out here and lay out all the plans that we have for our family for you to approve and be like, okay, 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 I see why you're still renting. I don't need to do all of that. But what I am saying is that if you're not careful, if you're someone who has not built that kind of um, resilience against people's opinions, you will find yourself being swayed and you'll be making decisions based on what other people expect of you. That's the pressure that I am talking about. I can't tell you how many times people People have expressed surprise when we say we're still renting. Like I said, we don't owe these people any explanation. I don't need to tell you that, oh, we're investing or we're doing this and this is our plan around home ownership. I don't need to explain that to you. But sometimes, you know, people would speak to you as if you owe them an explanation and you don't. Have you liked this video yet? Please do so before we continue. Okay, now let's talk about another one, which is, oh my goodness, when it came to talking about this particular popular opinion, right? I was a bit lost as to how to approach this topic because it is a sensitive one and it is one where people have very strong opinions. Yeah. You know how things are online, right? Everybody's either swinging left or right. And my opinion on that, if this is, you know, this has nothing to do with the video, but my opinion opinion on this whole left and right divide is that how is it that people cannot see that the solution to a lot of the things we fight about online is somewhere in the middle. Nobody wants to be in the middle ground anymore. Everybody's either left or right. People have very strong opinions for or against things. Anyways, let me not digress. This next opinion is that your marriage is at risk once you relocate abroad. As a matter of fact, what I see a lot online are people saying that your wife will leave you once you relocate and so you should not relocate with your wife or you shouldn't bring your wife over. That's the popular opinion. My own opinion about this is I do not see how relocation abroad is enough to break a marriage that wasn't already standing on shaky legs before. If your marriage was already spotting cracks and fault lines and you did nothing to address it, then you should not be blaming the fact that you relocated abroad as the reason why your marriage broke up. And going further from there, I am just, you know, I'm a social worker and it's a bit hard for me to talk about something like this without bringing my knowledge, not just theoretical knowledge, but knowledge that I see play out every single day 
at work. I want you to keep in mind that in every interpersonal relationship, there is a power balance at play. Where you begin to see relationships that degenerate into toxic territory is where that power becomes imbalanced, which is why we talk about power imbalances. And just to keep this video very simple, if you trace the trail of benefits, that is where you would find the power. Who is benefiting? Who is benefiting from keeping that structure the way it is? Whether that structure is healthy or unhealthy. When I talk about benefit, I want you to think about the benefit in the sense of who has the decision-making powers for the most part in that relationship, who controls the resources, okay? Whose word is law in that dynamic? Is it an equitable dynamic or is it a master servant kind of dynamic and if it is that way who is likely the master and who is likely the servant or who is likely feeling like a master and who is likely feeling like a servant these are some of the things that contribute to the faultiness of a marriage that might eventually crash abroad and why does it crash abroad because the next question might be if the marriage is indeed faulty but has survived that many years in your home country why did it suddenly crash just because you moved to a different country? When we talk about the dynamic in relationships, we cannot ignore the wider environment. We can't ignore the systemic context in which that relationship exists because it is the system that either strengthens that power imbalance or not. So if a certain dynamic has already existed within a relationship where there's probably this master-servant complex in the relationship and then all of a sudden you're moving into a society that is more liberal, one that is egalitarian and talks about equality, okay, but also has systems that prop up all the structures within that system, even at the micro level. It is only a matter of time before those cracks grow even wider. While you're living your day-to-day -day life, settling into a new country is already really difficult on its own, right? When you first move, there will be lots of stressors, not entirely related to the relationship itself, but just external stressors, right? Suddenly you're in a new system where everything is done differently. You're starting over from scratch because you have to find a job. It's going to take you a while to find a job. Some people move to countries where they have to learn the language before they can even settle into that country successfully. Basically, it's like building your identity all over again in that new country. And that's on its own. These are external factors. Those on their own already have an impact on your relationship. And then if you add to that the power imbalance that I was talking about, that power and control dynamic that I was referring to earlier, it's just like hammer after hammer hitting a relationship that wasn't even healthy in the first place. Of course, it is going to crash. Another thing I'm going to say is that we are adults, right? And I believe we know. We know when something is not working. We know when we are standing on shaky grounds. It's just that, again, we have mastered the art of sweeping things under the carpet. We've mastered the art of ignoring things, possibly because the way things are set up favors someone in that relationship and they don't want the status quo to change, right? So we refuse to address those very red flags staring us in the face. And then suddenly when we move to a uh, different country where you can't ignore those red flags anymore. The rest is history. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section what you think. I don't want to dwell any further on that topic. Okay. And moving on to the last thing that I am going to talk about here. This is again, something that I see a lot online is that there's only a handful of options when it comes to your career choices. The most popular one being that you're most likely going to find yourself in some kind of caregiving job. That's a very popular opinion. It's like back home in Nigeria, I hear people say things like, oh, so you want me to leave Nigeria? You want me to leave my own country to go to um, Oyibo land and be packing shoes? <laughs> That just speaks to that assumption about the kind of jobs that are available. Or you would hear stories about people who were, for instance, medical doctors or lawyers back home doing low-skilled jobs. Yeah, so there is that perception as well that all you can ever do when you relocate is a care job or some kind of menial job or unskilled work. 
On this one, if you want to know my opinion, there's going to be a video coming right after this. Okay, so click on the end card when this video ends and it will take you to a whole video about the lies that we are told in respect of the kind of jobs we can do when we relocate abroad. And on that note, people, I have come to the end of this video. I would really love to read your comments in the comment section. And if I have left out any popular, unpopular opinion, okay, or if you just want to share your own opinion about things that you've observed or anything I have said in this video, you're more than welcome to do so in the comment section. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.